Well, I hope you all had a wonderful Valentine's Day just three days ago. Did anyone get cards or perhaps candy or flowers? Oh, too bad, a few. <laughs> well, today the love continues um, by reading 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter. If you have never heard any other um, passage from 1 Corinthians, Corinthians, then it's likely that you have heard this one. It is one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible about love. And we are reading it today and continuing the celebration of love, but this is a different kind of love. Now this love we usually hear expressed in this passage we hear read for weddings. But when Paul wrote these words, he's not writing them to a couple who is about to be married or who has been married. No. Paul is casting a vision here for the church in Corinth. He's writing to them and helping them to see a brand new way about thinking about their relationships in the church. Because let's face it, they were a hot mess. They had all kinds of divisions and all kinds of factions in the church. Now, these folks didn't have the benefit of having the Old Testament, so they relied on their knowledge of their favorite preacher. And so they were, some of them, um, playing the game of, my preacher is better than your preacher. Some of them prescribed to Paul. After all, Paul had founded the church there while some of them claimed Peter as having the superior insight, this book was written 17 years after Jesus died. And so some of them could still remember the very first Pentecost when Peter got up and after the outpouring of the Spirit, he preached the sermon of his life. And if you remember, 3,000 people were baptized that day. So they thought Peter was the one to follow. And then Others thought that, no, Apollos was the best teacher and preacher. He was a popular preacher in Corinth then. That was one of the divisions. And then we have the folks in that church who were visiting the temples and participating in that prostitution. And we have people who were members who were taking other members to church. We have people in that congregation who were were disrespecting the Lord's Supper. And so they were making pigs of themselves while other people in the church were starving to death. Like any church, this church was stratified in its wealth. There were some who were very wealthy and there were some who weren't wealthy at all. And so some who were wealthy, not all of them, but were using their wealth as a special privilege and saying, we deserve higher rank in this church than you. Well, if we were to have read the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, then there we would find Paul explaining about spiritual gifts. It was important that he set them straight because these people were very gifted. They had all kinds of gifts. One, some of them had the gift of tongues that we hear mentioned of in today's reading. Others had, were able to prophesy. Some were miracle workers. And some were lording it over others and saying that they were better than other people in the church. In chapter 12, Paul sets them completely straight. He said, no, these gifts are given for the common good. And then he goes into a discussion about the body of Christ. He says, everyone is essential to the body of Christ. And we're all interdependent when something happens to one and one is harmed all are hurt and when something good happens to one all are elevated so he's trying to get them to understand that this love is the kind of love that he's talking about that needs to exist in their relationships in english we have one word for love we can say love and we can mean many different things I love that the sunshine is shining today. I love my dog. I love my husband. They don't mean the same thing. 
You're glad to hear that, aren't you? I love dark chocolate. Don't get me any. But in the Greek, there are at least three different words for the word love. There's eros, from which we get the word erotic. Now, the Corinthians knew all about that kind of love. And then there's philo, from which we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But then there's this word, this kind of love that is beyond all other love, and it's agape. This love. This love is the love that is to be sought. Only God can love this way. But they were missing the boat. They weren't even, agape love wasn't even on their radar. You know, schisms and divides in the church have happened all throughout history. This church wasn't so unlike any other church. We look back into the pages of history. We know in 1054 that there was the great schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. They were arguing over doctrine. They were arguing over the relationship between the Father and the Son and how those two related to the Holy Spirit. And they couldn't agree, so they split. And then in 1517, a man named Martin Luther, ever hear of him, nailed his 95 theses onto the door of the cathedral at Wittenberg Castle, and he was a Catholic priest. He wanted reform, but those actions took put into event, a chain of actions that resulted in Protestantism and the Reformation, and now we have many more churches in our own time closer to home and in our own country our church has been divided over the issue of slavery the issue of ordination of women I can't understand that one can you the ordination of gays and lesbians the definition of marriage there was a man and he was at the end of his rope and so he went out and he was on the edge of a bridge and he was getting ready to jump. Thankfully, a, a by passerby came along and he said, hey, mister, it can't be that bad. Come on down, let's talk about this. He says, no, he says, nobody loves me. I have nothing to live for. A passerby says, well, do you believe in God? And he said, sometimes. And the man said, Oh, okay. Well, are you Jewish or are you Christian? And the man says, I'm Christian. The passerby said, yeah, me too. How about that? Well, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? And the man on the bridge says, I'm a Protestant. And the guy on the ground says, me too. How about it? He says, what denomination are you? He says, I am a Presbyterian. And the man on the ground floor said, I am too. We have so much in common. He says, the man on the ground says, well, what are you? Are you PCA? Are you PCUSA? And the man who is standing ready to jump says, I'm PCA and proud of it. Immediately, the man on the ground reached up and pushed him over and said, die, heretic. We laugh, but it is really so sad because every time we fracture, every time we split, Christ's witness is compromised. And so Paul is trying to get through to this church in Corinth. He's trying to paint this picture of this different way. It's not erotic love. It's not brotherly love. This is God's brand of love. This brand of love is rooted in a decision of the will. It's not wishy-washy. It doesn't, it's not based in feeling. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It is 
be up before dawn, boots on the ground, tools in hand, ready to build community within the community of the church. Beautiful. Now, our Lord said that we, he, before he, um, one of the very last prayers, his very last prayer was found in the Gospel of John. And he had us on his mind. He prayed to the Father that we might be one. Also, one of the very last things that Jesus said to his disciples in the context of washing their feet, the Last Supper, he says, what I have done for you, this is my commandment, a new commandment, love one another, love one another, serve one another as I have loved you. This kind of love is a love that always puts the best interest of the other person first, a love that protects, a love that understands that what happens to one of us affects us. There's a football team, a high school football team, that although they may not understand it in quite these terms, demonstrated this kind of love. I'd like to share a very short film clip with you. Let's take a look. We end tonight with the football play of the month. It was executed with amazing precision by the Eagles, the Olivet Eagles. Steve Hartman has the play and the post-game analysis on the road. Between classes, they schemed and conspired. For weeks, the football players here at Olivet Middle School in Olivet, Michigan, secretly planned their remarkable play. Did anybody go, this is a crazy idea? No, everyone was in on it. Well, like the coaches didn't know anything about it. So we were like going behind their back. I've just never heard of a team coming up with a plan to not score. It's just like to make someone's day, make someone's week, just make them happy. The play, which was two plays actually, happened at a home game earlier this month. The first part of their plan was to try to get as close to the goal line as possible without scoring even if it meant taking a dive on the one-yard line, which it did. The crowd was not happy. Quarterback Parker Smith. But us kids knew, hey, we got this. This is our time. This is Keith's time. Keith Orr is the little kid in the brown jacket. He's learning disabled, struggles with boundaries, but in the sweetest possible way. Because of his special nature, it's no surprise that Keith embraces his fellow football players. What is surprising is how they have embraced him. We thought it'd be cool to do something for him. Because we really wanted to prove that he was part of our team and he meant a lot to us. Nothing can really explain getting a touchdown when you've never had one before. Which brings us to part two of their play. If you didn't see Keith, it's because they were so protective of him. But he was in the middle of that rush. And when you crossed the goal line, what was that like? Awesome. <laughs> it was like, did he just score a touchdown? Get your camera out. Oh my God, did I can't. Keith's parents, Carrie and Jim, almost missed the moment, but they got the significance. Somebody's always going to have his back from now until the day he graduates. She's right. When the football team decides you're cool, pretty much everyone follows suit. Today, Keith is a new kid, although by no means was he the only one who was profoundly changed. What was it like for you? It was like, like once I saw him going, I was smiling like about like here. <laughs> wide receiver Justice Miller. Like nothing could wipe that smile off my face. Why did it affect you so much? Because like he's never been like cool or popular and he went from being like pretty much a nobody to making everyone's day. I mean, Justice admits the play wasn't his idea. I would have not really thought about that. He says it never crossed his mind to give Keith any glory. Well, I, I kind of went from being somebody like mostly care about myself and my friends to caring about everyone and trying to make everyone's day in everyone's life. 
which may just make that touchdown the most successful football play of all time. Steve Hartman on the road in Olivet, Michigan. Is anybody crying? So this football team reminded us of um, something that we all know, and, and that is that we're better when we're together and when we take care of one another. C.S. Lewis once said, um, as soon as we act as if we love our neighbor, we find out one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will love them. When we love in that way, it changes them, but it also changes us. This is God's idea to change the world, and we are called as the church to give that witness of unity and of love and acceptance so that other people will know that there is something different. They will say, look at how they love one another. I want some of that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.